we'll discuss today some of the, the goals and some of the strategy about the Nation of Islam. And that is that it is the only nation dedicated to the use of violent means to attain its goals. Assalamu alaikum, Minister Malcolm. How are you, brother? Listen, stay right where you are. I'm on my way. I never the cars played. Yo, I ain't here to attack your religion, but your religion is attacking me. Damn. So we gonna give y'all Europeans, Jews, Arabs, and Africans and y'all religions back. God body. This is the Mr. Malcolm. It's a pleasure, sir. Assalamu alaikum, young man. How are you? Okay, brother, I know you have a million questions. And I promise you I can I can answer them all. Yes, sir, you have a lot of explaining to do. I have a million questions and I expect a million answers from you. You see, based on the phone that I gave you, the year is actually 2023. So we're 60 years from the time that you got assassinated. I run a company called Native Labs, and we did a project to bring you back to this time. And it took some science of genetics, and it might sound crazy, time travel. Yes, brother, I see the year. And so my question to you is, how did you pull this off? I'll have to detail a lot of that when we get to the house. But essentially, I brought you back because we're here to help solve a major problem. And actually, you and another man, I know you know who that man is. We all created the problem. And so, my objective is to get you to help me fix it. I'm ready for everything you have to tell me, brother. You lead, and I will follow. Let's get out of here. All right. Can I get you anything? Water? Anything? No, thank you, beloved. I'm, I'm fine. All right. So, let's unload this story. I have been working with a company called Native Labs that I formed about four years ago. I've been working in the health field for about 22 years. And the company was formed basically to help heal disease, but my studies are into anti-aging. And this comes directly from the messenger talking about uh, we'll have the youth of a 16 year old. So fast forward, I was supposed to do a documentary on you a couple years ago, but I've been putting it off. I came across a technology while in the lab to resurrect people. Wow, you, you're blowing my mind right now. I was under the presumption that the resurrection was mental based on how Elijah Muhammad taught the subject. You were saying that it's physical and obviously you know something because I'm here. Well, yes, the resurrection is mental, but it's also physical. Meaning in the future, and it's also happening now in certain black ops programs, you will be able to have people who lived 
physically resurrected. A little bit different than you. Your situation came by way of, I was able through studying physics and the genetics to use time travel and genetics together to get you here. And uh, it's complex. So in less than 60 years, we've been able to accomplish cloning essentially and time travel. Yeah, you blow my mind right now, young man. This is a lot. Now the why, of course, right. The why is because now the nation of Islam is headed by Minister Farrakhan. So Minister Lewis X, or Farrakhan now, according to what you're telling me, is the head of the nation of Islam. And the Imam Wallace has died. A lot that has taken place over the 60 years, brother. Yes, Minister Farrakhan has been the head of the nation since 1977. Uh, Wallace, Imam Wartha Dean, passed away years ago. And um, there has been a great divide amongst black people because of the incidents that occurred between you and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And so I'm doing this documentary, but I brought you back so that you can tell the story. I definitely welcome that. But how has the rift between myself and Elijah Muhammad impacted black people 60 years later? Well, the people don't know what happened. And so some of what you don't know that happened, meaning who shot you that day uh, and how the story unfolded, you're going to learn that part from me. But what I need you to tell is what exactly happened between you and the messenger so that the people will understand with clarity the mistakes, the emotions that were a part of it and gain the lesson and here's why they need to gain the lesson it is because we have put together what you and the messenger wanted us to have we have that government that is definitely going to be a lot to cover wait you're telling me that you all have built a separate government for black people here in the United States of America. So this is an effort to save more people because we are at a time in history now where things are about to change drastically and our people are behind. And so this documentary will help them and it will alter the future. Well, I definitely have a lot to say and I can give you some tips on who and what was the catalyst to stopping the movement. All right, so how this works is I set up the interview and you tell us what happened what happened between you and the messenger what happened between you and evelyn and lucille what happened between you and betty what happened between you and minister farrakhan and wallace and overall what were you actually attempting to do and what do you think blocked or stopped that particular thing and if you can share that with the people, I think that will be enough to close the chapter on what happened to you in the past. Now we gotta deal with what's about to happen to you in the future. And so, and so I got down too. Then when I was looking amazement to the front, I knew they had shot my husband.
Greetings, family. I am Dr. Amaru Shia Ali. We are here with Aboriginal Global Media, and we are here to talk about our three-part documentary series on the Nation of Islam called The Nation of Islam Unveiled. Today, we'll be doing part one, which deals with Malcolm's truth. This particular documentary is being done because of my own personal scholarship history, interaction with the Nation of Islam and grassroots organization within the United States of America. So first, I think it's good to go over some of my own personal history. I was born in Columbia, South Carolina, and my father, Robert Counts Jr., was a well-known state track athlete and famous football player in South Carolina. And throughout the 60s and 70s, he was a part of the grassroots organizations, the Panthers and the young student movements and even got kicked out of school uh, for shutting down colleges like Voorhees College and ended up in Vietnam. And so my father had great experience with the awareness of the movements in the 60s and the 70s. And in fact, my birth name, Marcus Ali, comes from the fact that he was aware of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey and one of his favorite athletes, Muhammad Ali. He named me after those two people. And so I have a rich history coming from the South with awareness in my family and that awareness spread to me. When I was young, I remember my father giving me the book, How to Eat to Live. I was about 16 years old. And when you're that young, of course, we in the 80s and the 90s, so it's hip hop. And I was aware of Islam, but not as aware. But I was aware enough to name my first nephew from my older sister, Hakeem. And so they were startled when I chose that name and she gave me the grace to name him but I think that's my catalyst point because he, me, and Malcolm X all have something in common. I share a birthday with my oldest nephew, but in the system that I have developed from studying indigenous cosmology and psychology, me, Malcolm X, and my nephew share the same psychological profile. It's called Oshalahun. It'll become important as we discuss more and move forward. But I ended up getting the scholarship to Temple University and going to Philadelphia when I was 17 years old. I lived in Philadelphia from the time that I was 17 to the time that I was 40 years old, 23 years. Went to college there, married there, had all my children there. And so I came into consciousness in college from my roommate, shout out to brother Kareem Gilliard. Uh, that's a great brother uh, and a friend and uh, his family was in the first with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and they shared things with me. Of course, they were Sunni Muslims at the time and I was learning the distinctions uh, when I was 19, 20 years old. And there was a brother who had just come home from prison, one of Kareem's friends, Brother Nick. He gave me a book from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that dealt with the true history of Jesus. It was another brother, True Knowledge God Allah, who I used to cut his hair at Temple University. And he used to always try to get me to uh, come to Parliament and learn your lessons. And uh, so he became my enlightener. He ended up getting killed. And so I had the Nation of Gods and Earths and the Nation of Islam influence from the time that I was about 19 years old. And eventually it impacted me to the point that when I was in college, I started eating how to eat to live and studying the Messenger's books, studying Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, that's another first book that I had, the ISIS papers. And so the consciousness began and my journey into studying uh, what we call black consciousness uh, started um, early in my life and it kind of is in my bloodline a little bit, but it started in Philadelphia. So shout out to Philly. Uh, I love that city. And even though I'm a country boy, and I'm back down south now. I still love Philly. Um, and so that is the origins of my beginnings. Uh, I had an opportunity to see Dr. Khalid Muhammad speak 
1999 in Philadelphia. And I also had a chance to hear Minister Farrakhan speak in 1999 at Tinley Baptist Church. I believe that's in South Philly. And wow, that is 25 years ago or something like that. You know, a long time that uh, I have been involved in a meticulous study. Um, I was never a religious type of person, always kind of had a scientific mind. And so the culmination of this documentary is a result of that type of thinking and that type of study since about 1997 and moving up into this time to record the events of what I see as a great lesson we can learn. Okay, so now let's talk about the purpose of the documentary and the structure of the documentary. So you can get an understanding of my mind as I develop this idea over a very long period of time. The purpose of the documentary in this first part is to give you the unique view of Malcolm X and the cause of why he is no longer with us today. There are many documentaries on Malcolm X. His killer has already been identified, all right? William 25X out of Newark, New Jersey, Talmadge Hare, and Talmadge Hare identified two other people in his affidavits after uh, he began to disclose that the people, other two people who were accused were not the killers. So we have that data. And that uh, data is solid for certain. We know who killed Malcolm X. But what we don't know is what led up to his real division from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his dissatisfaction with the Nation of Islam. Some of the points that we have been given I consider completely erroneous. And when I disclose in this documentary, in the first part, the true reason why Malcolm X fell, why Malcolm X uh, was put in a position where his decline led him into assassination, it will be the first time ever that the documented facts from his own hand discuss and detail that. In part two, I deal with something called Elijah's vision. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is a very important man in the history of black America. So important, the teachings, the movement that he started shifted the entire socio-political, religious framework, not only of the United States of America, but of the world. And so this very important man, we also have to look at in a very honest light, his teachings, how they compare to Orthodox Islam. As a scholar, I have written a 437 page dissertation on this subject. So I'm well acquainted uh, as a historian with the subject matter. I am not speaking to you as a Muslim because I am not a Muslim. I am a man and a human being who understands that I have to look at things in a scientific and somewhat of an artful way. I see myself and all human beings as the supreme beings on this planet. And we can discuss that in the sense of human biological polymorphisms, evolution, uh, all of our abilities and inventions, the way our brain works etc. And I'm thankful for the teacher of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because I do see him, Master Far Muhammad, as a very pivotal person who unveiled that type of psychology that is necessary for human beings to be responsible, not in a religious way, not in a way uh, to put one human being over the other, strictly in a religious uh, fashion where people have used religion to their detriment. I think he used religion in a healthy way to disclose a psychology that was needed for black Americans and is actually needed for the world. And so we will talk about that in part two of the documentary, Elijah's vision. We also will talk about in a kind of retroactive way, 
How was Elijah Muhammad seeing the circumstances around Malcolm? What was it that was the real catalyst to Elijah Muhammad's uh, decline in the sense of the family, his first family, Clara Muhammad, his first wife, his children with that part of the family ended up saying, nah, man, you're not the messenger. Prophet Muhammad is the messenger. And there were distinct things that happened and is surrounding these women. And we have never had these things disclosed to us. And so what I want to do is bring a very, very mature psychological approach to this. I often use the example of Jay-Z. <clears throat> there are a lot of people that have mixed feelings about Jay-Z. Um, here's my position. Jay-Z is one of the most prolific hip hop artists ever to live. Any human being who listens to him and what he can do who negates the fact that this man is super, 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 super talented. Yeah, they're in their feelings, as you say. But from being around those circles, having uh, a former friend, Jay Electronica, who signed to Rock Nation, seeing the movements from a person who's skilled in human psychology, I can see the complaints about him, the things that have happened, uh, his son, uh, or the man who is claiming to be his son, who looks just like him, raps just like him, not even being able to file documents in a court for uh, the ability to find out that he's a parent. Any one of us who, if a woman claims, hey, that's your child, you know, the court subpoena you, you know, you live in the jurisdiction, you have to follow those rules. And so that wasn't following that scenario. So I'm, I'm talking about the difference between a person's uh, purpose and maybe some character flaws that they may have. I'm mature enough to say Jay-Z is brilliant, but also I it's obvious, the character flaws are obvious, not only from the testimonies of multiple people, but from watching him. And so I apply that same thing to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And my, my FOI brothers and some people in the nation get uncomfortable when I talk about that. But I am not taken away from his divinity, his purpose, and you often see me refer to him as the messenger because I do stand on the fact that without that man being taught and him going through the labor of doing what he, he has done, we would be in a lot of trouble. But I also recognize the facts that I have gathered over all of these years. And I have to display those facts and talk about uh, the psychological and social fallout of decisions that he made that caused us to lose in some ways and caused us to win in some ways. And in the third part, I'll talk about the fall of the nation of Islam, which is probably the most controversial part because I go through the FBI files and I gather the information about the top lev informants in the nation of Islam. And I give you, based on my assessment, who those three people are. So we're in for a treat. This is Malcolm's Truth. This is Eliza's vision. This is the fall of the nation of Islam. And as I disclose more about the political, the social work that we do, it will make sense why I am so involved in studying this particular truth on the nation of Islam unveiled. So in our first part of the documentary, we have a short stint on Malcolm's genealogy. And I think this is really important and pertinent to the subject matter. And the reason why I think it's important is because we have heard Malcolm X say things out of his own mouth. And sometimes when we have a very prominent figure, uh, like Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and they get sort of deified in the media for various purposes. We look back at their scholarship and we never question things. But Malcolm was a Pan-African. But it is a fact that when you look up his genealogy, as we will disclose in the first uh, parts that we narrate, that uh, Earl Little, Malcolm's father, was born in Georgia. And when we trace his genealogy, what we start finding out is that 
the things that Malcolm said. Hey, my name is X now because uh, I got the last name from a slave master. Uh, there is absolutely no proof of that. The name Little and the places that he was born and when you trace his genealogy back in those areas all go back to indigenous tribes. And in fact, as we have shown through some of our dissertations that we have written, our black Americans, uh, aboriginals or Africans, we show the Moorish Islamic presence and the Moorish European presence in early America. So what does that mean? Abu uh, Bakra, or Bukhari, and his, him being Mansa Musa's brother, arrived in the United States and we have the proof of it in the Yucatan, in Louisiana, Texas, Arizona, Nevada, the ancient scripts of languages of Arabia that come from that particular part of the planet. We know that they arrived, those 2,000 ships came here and they left uh, less school lessons and all of the evidence. I used to do translations for the Epigraphical Society for uh, written by Dr. Barry Fell and teams of linguists. And I was asked to do translations on uh, Arabia writing that they thought was Native American writing at some particular point. And I did those, this was in the early 2000s. So uh, we do know that the family crest names in early European history go all the way back to Moorish families who came to the Americas as well. So when I did my research on the little name, it was very foggy. I was not able to find littles with uh, lots of slaves that they named little. Uh, in fact, I found uh, littles who were coming here as slaves who were European. Uh, and I found black families with the name little or little from Europe as well. And so what I'm saying is we have to review the stances that people take based on real and accurate history. And this is, as we mentioned earlier, I'm a part of a political movement called the Aboriginal Republic of North America and the Indigenous Political Authority. And the theme is simple. We want to help indigenous peoples restore institutions, political rights uh, throughout the world, in Africa, in the Caribbean, in the Americas. And so, uh, the language that we use, the legal lees, the terms, they will have to be grown and matured because we're at a point in time where using certain terminology can defeat us from understanding real history. And I'm saying that Malcolm X uh, was a victim of that. Uh, he was a very, very, very articulate man, very well studied man, but the release of information, the access to information has grown since that time, over 60 years ago. We have better information now so we can do better things. And so I discussed that genealogy uh, in the first part of this documentary. In the second part of this documentary, we get to, let's not call it the meat, let's call it the bison and the vegan potatoes. We talk about what was the cause of the fall of Malcolm X. And it happened in 1959. And it dealt with the fact that Malcolm X, who the media uses against our people, he was a civil rights leader and all. Malcolm X was the human rights leader and he was taught that angle from his teacher. But he became upset with his teacher for one reason. He wrote to his teacher in 1959 and he disclosed to his teacher that he had fornicated with one woman and that he had illicitly courted several others. Now in the nation of Islam, there's a restrictive law. You don't have sex with a woman who you're not married to. And so Malcolm confessed to Elijah Muhammad that he had sex with one woman and her name is Sister Evelyn. And we detail this. So now that's 1959. Years later, Wallace Muhammad, the son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad discloses to Malcolm that his father has several wives and that Evelyn is one of the wives. It tore Malcolm apart. 
this was the beginning of the vile anger and that jealousy that anger is what fueled him into the emotional spiral that he was in added on to that particular problem was his confession on record to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad who he confided in in a very emotional way to talk about his very poor relationship with Betty Shabazz. Lesson, often we look at people like Dr. Betty Shabazz and Malcolm X, they are a great couple and revolutionary. Not to know that they had one of the most troubling marriages that you could ever dream of. And this is from the hands of Malcolm X himself describing it. The deep details that he went to went into in writing the messenger on what was the cause of this also led him into an emotional spiral because he disclosed to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that he had no way of sexually pleasing Betty Shabazz. After he found out that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad had multiple wives, after he had disclosed the same thing to Mother Clara, he felt like the first family was using this against him. He even wrote as far as to say that Betty Shabazz threatened to cheat on him with other men if he did not give her the attention and the satisfaction that she desired. So I'm saying this to say we look at people in the wrong way. We're human. We mature over time through experience. And so this is not to bash uh, Mother Betty Shabazz. I think that she's an awesome woman. And this is definitely not to put down Malcolm and emasculate him and make him feel like he's something other than a great man. But it goes to show that as a people, we have to really, 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 really understand the tactics of the enemies of our people and how they use our leaders to deify them. But yet the lessons that we need to learn that we go through every day if we could relate to those leaders that we uphold with such esteem, we would find and understand the problems that they went through and learn real lessons about life. And so the catalyst of the divide between the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X has never been talked about. The women have been talked about, but nobody told you that Malcolm confessed to fornicating was just to Evelyn. Nobody told you that in those interactions, he shared that information directly with Mother Clara and with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And this is by his own hand. He's confessing these things in letters. I used to do tours at the Schoenberg Museum. And so in the early 2000s, I started coming across these letters and I'm like, who knows this information and why is this not in documentary form yet? As more document uh, documentaries documentaries came out and I'm looking at them and I'm like is this some kind of secret or something and as I authenticated the letters I'm saying oh wow they have a plan to make Malcolm uh, a media star and use him against Elijah Muhammad to suppress Elijah Muhammad and to lift Malcolm up and to redo his image so they don't want these things up because this would make uh, the situation much more clear between the two men and so the statement about teenage secretaries was partially false and partially true there were no teenage secretaries there was one teenage secretary Evelyn was in her 30s Lucille was in her 30s. There were seven wives. And we have the data, the birth, real birth dates on all of them. We even have it where when Minister Farrakhan brought the women out, he hid the fact that one of them was a teenager. So here we have it in our discussions. We have to look at this and say, wow, there was a lot that was going on in this scenario. So in our narrations, we're gonna show you the exhibits, but I would like to elaborate on the history of what occurred. 
Malcolm was brought this information by Wallace Muhammad. In part three, I will show that Wallace Muhammad was in fact an informant. That's important because the US Department of Justice and the FBI had one goal. Hoover had one goal, and that was to create a divide between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad, which would essentially destroy the nation of Islam. We have this on record, it's in the FBI files. What's also in the FBI files is that the US Department of Justice and the FBI put five informants in the black community, three in the nation of Islam, two outside of the nation of Islam. And we know who all five are. That's important. We're gonna just discuss that in part three. But I mentioned that here to say that who were the top lev, because that's the term that they use, meaning top level, within uh, a circle of about 12 people. There are three people who were there who were placed there or coerced into cooperating to create a divide between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. And Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad suffered because they fell victim to this plot. They failed to overcome this plot. And all of it was surrounding women. Now, earlier I told you something, I shared something very personal. I have in my indigenous psychological profile, the same profile as Malcolm X, so does my nephew. And this is a system that I studied from going into Mexico and studying a particular calendar that the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad talked about. And I was surprised to find, not surprised, but surprised of where I found it, that it's a real 25,000 year calendar. And I have written extensively on this textbooks uh, research going to Mexico and studying these things. But suffice it to say, these people, the she, the uh, misnamed Olmec and Maya, have the oldest calendar system on the planet and they develop a psychoanalysis system from it. So I'm saying that to say that when I look at the problems of Malcolm X with his wife, it's so interesting that I personally had similar problems two divorces. And my nephew, who has that same profile, has had some great challenges. And so I started to see that as I was laying a basis for an indigenous paradigm, I'm actually looking at the lessons of Elijah Malcolm, having an opportunity to have a very extensive and detailed scientific system to do psychology with. And bearing witness to the truth of the evidence of it, which is the most important thing. Malcolm spiraled because he did not control his emotions. The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a part of his work spiraled because he did not contain his emotions. He was upset about his sons telling him that Muhammad was the messenger. He was upset about the exposure of his domestic life. And I would not be talking about any man's family had not this all become public. I'm talking about this to bring some uh, resolution to the situation. And as we look at it, we go back and we look at all of the women, all right, seven women, and there was one of them in particular who was a teenager. Her name was Ola Hughes. And a unique thing that I found out about her is that her mother was in a polygynous relationship as well. So she grew up around a polygynous family, meaning a man with multiple wives. Her stepfather had two wives. Now, there are many people that have called Elijah Muhammad a pedophile. I would not use that language and the reason why I would not use that language is because he was never charged. He was never, uh, there wasn't anyone that put a claim against him saying he's a pedophile. In fact, if you review 
the lectures, which you will be able to in my narrations, Minister Farrakhan brought Ola and her son out and she spoke highly of this man. So highly. Now, I must give a caveat. I absolutely, personally, don't agree with that. But it's not my business. I have a 15 year old daughter, I have four daughters. One of them is 15, the, other one, the oldest is 18. I would not want a man in his 60s trying to marry my child. But I am aware of the stoic traditions that Elijah Muhammad was born out of. From Cadell, Georgia, Sandersville, Georgia, I passed there on I-20 going to my mom's house, often taking my children there. And it was common during that time period for older men to be with younger women. That's not an excuse. That's just a reality of what happened. Then if you're feeding on literature, the Bible, Isaac, 40 years old, his wife, Rebecca, 10. You learn about Prophet Muhammad. And even though this is absolutely unverifiable history from the Hadith, we do get it from the Hadith that he consummated a marriage with a child, a grown man. So now if you are in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and you are feeding on this and you are forming your religious community, that psychology imprints itself on you and you start advancing behaviors that mirror that. Now we are far beyond that particular type of study. In fact, the type of study that we have engaged in ARNA specifically in the Aboriginal Medical Association and later Native Labs, we're finding out why young women are having menses so early. It is accelerated epigenetic and genetic aging that is taking place. All of my daughters got their menses at later times because of how they ate as a uh, young women, young girls, all of them. I even kept them out and homeschooled them so they wouldn't be interacting with the pheromones of men. One child had a, uh, her menses at 14, another 13, one almost 15. And so what I'm saying to you is that knowledge puts you in a position to make better decisions. Women should not even be going through puberty until they're about 16 to 19 in a very healthy body. A 16 year old and a 19 year old are not mature enough to begin to interact sexually with men. But in a society that is becoming more feminist, men even today are seeking younger women uh, in the sense of trying to find some form of purity in the women. I do not agree with that, but I will use science to measure how we should move at this particular point and look at the past and understand what thoughts grow out of what social conditions, what social engineering is giving rise to those particular things. In the video that the Nation of Islam presented on Ola Hughes, she was given a birth date that is false. I have the real birth date. She was 15 when she began to interact with Elijah Muhammad and she was 16 when she had her son. Those dates have been moved around, but we live in a time now we can get everybody's birthday and certify it. And so I have done that and I'll show that in the narrations. And I'll go into much more detail than I'm going into now about that situation. But that is important to highlight because it brings people inside of the nation or people who love the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to a crossroads in evaluating him properly. And in my stance, it doesn't take away from the divinity of the man, but it does shed a picture of how mature we have to be when we encounter famous people. This world of sort of idolatry that we're moving into, going viral, People, everybody wanted to be famous and important. Attention factors. 
This is all a form of psychosis that is very dangerous. And so I am discussing this in a very humble way to say that a person can be a brilliant person, but have faults. And we are here to learn from those faults because you will never catch me talking to a 15 year old girl because of my level of understanding. There's nothing a 15 year old young woman could do for me except be my daughter and let me raise her up to be the type of woman who could have a husband and grow a family the proper and the mature way. So that dagger, imagine being Mother Clara Muhammad. How are you gonna to respond to that? Imagine being his children. How are you gonna to respond to that? Imagine being the other wives and you're 30 and you find out he has a 15 year old wife and he's a messenger. So you may be intimidated about questioning him about why he made that decision. This is all part of how we heal. We talk honestly with no malice. I have no malice towards Malcolm X. I have no malice towards uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I have no malice towards any of these, these people, the, the women, some of whom came out and said things that were false. I have no malice towards them. I understand that situations can be heated, but somebody has to have the cool head and the head of intelligence to guide. And this is what this particular documentary is about. And so now, as we look at what we want to talk about in regards to Malcolm's situation, how we peel back the very gentle layers of what happened to him. In our concluding part, in this first part to this three-part series, we discuss the details of the lead up to Malcolm's assassination what was being put into Muhammad Speaks, what was being said from the mouth of the Arab Elijah Muhammad, what happened in the lead up? What happened at the mosque in Newark? Who was at that mosque and why were they there? Did John Ali talk to Talmadge Hare at any particular point as Carl Evans made that accusation? What did Talmadge Hare have to say about the other people involved? He said there were four people involved. Two of them got arrested and they were exonerated. William 25X Bradley lived a regular life and died. And there were so many people who knew that he was one of the killers. He was the one who had the sawed off shotgun. It's a very good documentary on that already. Who are the other killers that Talmadge Hare identified? Why was Malcolm's younger student, Louis X, at the Newark Mosque with John Ali? Why did Wallace tell Malcolm what he told him in the way that he told him. There were culminating factors working to separate Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. And the three people I have mentioned, Wallace Muhammad, Louis X, also known as Louis Farrakhan, and John Ali stand out like sore thumbs in the FBI records, in their actions, in their interactions with uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and with Malcolm X. It's a fatal story of a man who was attempting to do something. He started the OAU, OAAU, Organization of Afro-American Unity. He started the Muslim Mosque Incorporated, was traveling to Africa, to the Middle East, to Europe, doing debates at Oxford. He was in motion to catalyze something that he had been taught that was gonna happen. I recall words from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad saying, I will never teach 
a man like I taught Malcolm again. Why? What did he teach him? Malcolm started implementing the things that the messenger had told him would come at a later date. He wanted the power. He was hurt. He was disappointed. He saw himself as an intellectual superior. And not only that, as we look at the conspiring parties that were present, their actions, their behaviors, in respect to these two men, all point to an overwhelming reality. That overwhelming reality comes in about three distinct lessons. Number one, from my study of humans, inability to control your emotions has been and will be the cause of any of our success potentials. Whether we're the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, Chief Ali, it does not matter. The human being can get disappointed, but the human being has the power to reflect, to calm ourselves, and to not make action out of those emotions. All of us have that ability. If we choose otherwise, the conditions can be mathematically calculated to heighten the potential of danger, no matter who we are. That is the first lesson. The second lesson, if you have a code Stick to it. The body has a cold. The stomach is for digestion. If you put something in there that's indigestible, you're going to injure it. That's a law. Malcolm X violated the law. He fornicated with the system. After fornicating with the sister, he confessed it. He married a woman that he was having great trouble with. And he stayed. One of the things that we have found in our studies at the Aboriginal Medical Association is that a man who is being stressed, one of the things that we have found at the Aboriginal Medical Association is that a man who is being stressed by a woman is exchanging pheromonic activity with her, molecular odorants that are tied to and impact his hormonal system. I can watch Malcolm X's testosterone drop because of the things that were occurring in his marriage as I study what happened to him. We have to learn the science of mating, making good choices based on a code. If we breach the code, we have to fix it quickly or else it will cascade into this emotional entropy that I am talking about. Entropy being the collapse of an orderly system into chaos. And so Malcolm, Elijah, and the others in those circles had a code that they started to violate and it caused an entropic disorder to fall over. And lastly, all of us have to work to design our purpose, not find it. And this is what we have discovered in our indigenous paradigm. We each have attributes Malcolm has attributes, great speaker, great student. He was using some of those and developed those. But there were people around him who were not developing those who wanted what he had. 
and they worked and were willing to work with opposing parties, governmental entities, to ensure that they got what they wanted in breach of the bond that they had with their own brothers and sisters for money, for fame. Low self-esteem masks itself very well. And sometimes the most famous people we look at as rich and wealthy and powerful show signs of low self-esteem. And they need help. And how you help them is a jurisdiction that has the institutions that can identify those particular problems and eradicate them. Courts, where there can be arbitration and or lawsuits. It was called the Nation of Islam, but it functioned as the religion of Islam that made great economic strides and was developing itself gradually. And in the second part, I will show you that that was the goal of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. His goal was to get it to a full nation with a constitution and institutions because those structures can help us alleviate some of the things that we go through in cults or religious bodies that cause collapse. And we watched the nation of Islam have people who wanted the throne. They fought over that throne from the 1930s all the way till today. When in fact, wise men will make multiple thrones, share the power for the good of the circle. You are watching Malcolm's Truth. And I am your host, Dr. Amaru Shiali. Malcolm X, El Hajj Malik Shabazz, one of the greatest black leaders of the 20th century, national representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. This controversial political figure we will discuss today. And in this first part, we will begin by talking about his lineage, his origins. A great paradox that we will find is that as a Pan-African, it appears from doing research on his lineage that Malcolm X has indigenous American lineage from Ghana, where his mother was born, and from Georgia, where his father, Earl Little, was born. Both Malcolm's mother and father were participants in the UNIA of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. Earl Little participated in leading some of the local UNIA jurisdictions. And Louise Little was a secretary. In fact, it was the activity of Earl Little with the UNIA and growing the consciousness in Omaha, in Michigan, and other areas they lived in that caused the Black Legion to attack the family. And although his death was labeled as a suicide, it was suspected that the Black Legion killed Earl Little because of his activity with the UNIA. The UNIA was Marcus Garvey's movement in the early 20th century. And this particular movement 
focused on our African heritage. What we are finding more and more as we do research amongst ourselves, on ourselves, and on even the greats who have come before us, is that those who were born here, especially in the American South, in South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, Texas, North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, most of us have indigenous heritage. In fact, Louise Little, who is depicted here, was born in Granada. And when we do the research of the potential triangulation of lineage that she could have, we have Arawak, Kalanago, which we call Carib, and then the invading French who invaded that particular island. And so as we view Louise Little, this beautiful woman who, after her husband died, attempted to remarry and ended up in a mental institution until her children were able to get her out, we can see the lineage of both her and her husband, Earl Little, tying to indigenous people. Here we see the name Little amongst the Cherokee, various names, even the name John Little, who was Malcolm's grandfather and great-grandfather, found amongst the Choctaw and the Cherokee. So the name Little was used amongst indigenous people. Many of the European names that we think are exclusively from Europe are not and need a footnote of explanation. Here we have a Johnson Little who fought with the Cherokee and his complexion is listed as dark, his eyes dark, his hair as dark. Here we have some of the history of Malcolm X. The 1930 census lists Malcolm X as age four. That is inaccurate. It should represent him as age five at that particular time. And we see here his mother and father, Earl Little, and his mother, Louis Little. Malcolm was actually born on May 19th, 1925. So it should be four, and often in the censuses, you'll find ages off, people scramble. This is the actual and original record from that 1930 census as Malcolm was born in Omaha, Nebraska. All right. And you see his brothers and sisters there, Wilfred, Hilda, and the others are there. And so. Malcolm's family moved several times. Uh, they ended up moving in 1926 to Milwaukee and then to Lansing, Michigan. Here we have his father's uh, records in the census, 1910 census. And he was born in 1891. You see Malcolm's grandfather, John Little, and his grandmother, Ella little. And as we continue to go through and we look at all of the records, this is John Little and Ella when they were married and the children were not there. A close up of that particular record. We want to show you this genealogy because it's very important to not coming to bad conclusions about where people come from. All right. And you might have someone with a Pan-African ideology who has all indigenous ancestry. Here we have uh, John Little, that same John Little, his grandfather <coughs> at 10 years old with his great-grandfather, who's also John Little. And interestingly, his great-grandmother, Ellen Little, has the same name as his sister, Ellen, who we lived with when he was in Massachusetts. And here we have Nelson Little, who is the great great grandfather who was born in 1808, who was never a slave, who's listed as a mulatto, and he is what? 
a carpenter. Remember the movie where she said, Malcolm, you could become a carpenter. Isn't that ironic that his great, great grandfather, who was mulatto, was a carpenter? All right, now let's go back to his mother. This is an absolutely beautiful picture of her. She's from Granada. And one of the assumptions that is made is that the people of this particular area who have dark skin, uh, brown skin, kinky hair, got there as a result of the African slave trade. I do recommend you read my book, They Lied About the Slave Trade, because you will get the actual numbers uh, from the slave trade database and other websites that keep that data. We do know that the Kalinago, the Caribs, invaded that area where there were Arawaks, who were dark-skinned people. And later, the French came into that particular area. So we don't have a heavy... Uh, importation of Africans into that area. And some of the ones who we do find came as immigrant workers. And so we should make no assumption about uh, Malcolm's lineage on his mother's side, that it is anything but indigenous because because her features and the lineage that is on the island tell the story of who was in that particular area. And we should not come to any assumptions about or false conclusions about that. Okay, when it comes to the name Little, we find uh, Malcolm's father being born in Georgia, uh, his patrilineage being in Alabama and North Carolina. We find the name Little uh, amongst the Cherokee uh, fighting for the Confederates, dark-skinned Littles who were Cherokee. We find that name throughout the Choctaw, the Dawes Rolls, etc., now, for the proper view of history, we have Moorish people coming from Africa, which we found and talked about the Abu Bakari finds um, all throughout the South, uh, the Yucatan, all the way to California. And we also have Moors coming from Europe. And so these family crests, when you look them up, you'll see the names in Old English and other names coming from Moors because these names come from them first. Europeans were the most enslaved people. So we have no conclusive evidence to say he was named after a slave master and given the name Little. We do have conclusions to show that his family has been in the South on his patrilineage all the way back to 1808, not slaves. That is important. Okay. And his great great grandfather was listed as a mulatto, which is a signature call for the mixing of natives and Africans up to a point. And then later they molded that to fit uh, Africans and whites. All right. And so our conclusions about Malcolm's genealogy is we have to continue to do more research. But what we have is a man with patrilineage in the South going all the way back to 1808, whose forefathers and foremothers' uh, family names were listed on the native rolls, uh, also fought in Confederate uh, ranks in the Confederacy and the Union War, known as the Civil War. We call it the Rebellion. And on his mother's side, we have the Kalinago, and um, we also have the Arawak with some possible French ancestry. So we cannot say Malcolm X got his name little from a slave master. Uh, if that was true, then we would be able to find that in the censuses, in the records, and we have not. So that's inconclusive. And so our standing is that uh, Malcolm X's lineage leans way more towards the indigenous heritage, and we'll do a lot more research in the future as more documents come out. Part two. What caused the divide between Elijah and Malcolm? This is the most important part of the documentary as we are going to lay out what has never been presented to the people. These two prominent 20th century black leaders were at the pinnacle of the transformation of consciousness amongst our people. There was a concerted effort by the FBI and the United States government to separate them. They fell victim 
to those plots. That desire to separate them was put in writing. And it was recorded in 1969 that they had succeeded in causing factional disputes between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. They used the word developed. And they were developed. How were they developed? Well, in part three, you will learn the agent who came to Malcolm X and told him about Elijah Muhammad having children by six other women, possibly seven. Wallace Muhammad brought this information to Malcolm and Malcolm stated it himself. Malcolm attempted to continue to do his work. However, Malcolm also had a plan. As we see here, this is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad with Mother Tynetta Muhammad, who had four children by him. But Malcolm had a plan. When we review the statements that Malcolm made, they make no sense in light of information I am going to present. Malcolm was the boyfriend of one of Elijah Muhammad's wives or the mothers of his children before Elijah Muhammad conceived the child by her. Her name is Evelyn Muhammad. Malcolm confesses to fornicating with her and to unlawfully courting two other women, one of them being Lucille. And it was Lucille and Evelyn who filed charges who became popular in the public for raising this issue to the public. What you are learning and going to learn is that Malcolm did reveal this to the public. But what Malcolm did not reveal is the fact that he too was fornicating with women. So we have two prominent men, one conceiving children with women, having those women go through the challenges of being put out of the mosque, taking care of the children privately and attempting to keep it a private issue. We have another man who receives the information from an informant, Wallace Muhammad, the son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and proceeds to go into the public to stand on some type of moral foundation, accusing the messenger of breaking his own law, when it was a fact, it was known by the messenger that Malcolm was fornicating because he wrote it in a letter to detail it to the, to the messenger. And so what do we have here? We have very powerful men making mistakes in breach of their own code who could have handled the situations differently and had a different outcome. Malcolm lied and said that they were all teenagers. That is a lie. But he was accurate in saying that there was a teenager because one of them was a teenager. And that would be Ola Hughes. The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad had a wife and conceived children with several women, allowed them to be embarrassed, put out of the mosque, but did take care of them. Measuring either one of the man's character by the events that took place is your right. What we have here that has developed and is clear is that history has not toned or told the subject correctly. And they have favored Malcolm to diminish the Honorable Elijah Muhammad with the goal of diminishing the foundation, which is the nation of Islam itself. And so 
none of what you see in the media and most documentaries is presenting you with all of the facts. We are. And by gaining these facts, by seeing them, you learn multiple things. You learn that powerful people, men and women, are human and they make mistakes. You also learn what really happened with Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. You learn that Malcolm lied and you learn that Elijah Muhammad did not follow his own laws. And had either of them done opposite, you would see a powerful shining nation before you today. But what we have is the lessons that they have left us. And we can review those lessons so that we do not make the same mistakes in the future. Malcolm X is a powerful man. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is a powerful man. They both deserve respect. We are looking at their lives. And now I will let Malcolm tell his side of the story. The rebound and Mr. Muhammad himself said that I defected. But in reality, I never even left the Muslim movement. They put me out. And they put me out because of what I knew. And what I knew was told to me by Mr. Muhammad's son, uh, Wallace Muhammad himself. They put me out and they put him out. Well now, first of all, let's find out what it is that Wallace Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad's son, told you. Well, uh, number one, if you notice, the, the stick that I always used in presenting, representing, and defending the Muslim movement was the fact that it had the ability, re ability to reform the morals of the so-called Negro community. It eliminated drug addiction, alcoholism, uh, fornication, adultery, loose sex, sexual behavior, which meant that uh, it eliminated bastard babies, illegitimate children. Well, as long as I knew that this was what it represented and it gave me a strong stick, I could represent it and defend it. But uh, we had a law which uh, meant, which means, which was that uh, whenever any uh, Muslim became involved in any kind of sexual relationship with someone to whom they weren't married, that person would be brought before the Muslim community, humiliated, and then isolated for from one to five years. This was our law. Well, uh, in 1954, a teenage sister left Detroit and became one of Mr. Muhammad's personal secretaries. And uh, there in the Chicago office, she became pregnant after being there for a year. And uh, she was brought before the Muslim community and humiliated and isolated. And uh, a, year, a year later, another secretary, this time one from uh, Lansing, Michigan, uh, came to Chicago. She also became pregnant. She was brought before the community and humiliated and isolated. And because the other person was never brought forth during this uh, court session, it was uh, concluded by all of Mr. Muhammad's followers that it was a non-Muslim who was the other party. Well, we grew so rapidly that in 1957 or 58, the uh, secretarial staff was expanded to, I think, eight teenage sisters. In 1959, six of them disappeared. Two of them reappeared in Philadelphia about two or three months later, and they were all right. Uh, the other four reappeared in 1960. All four of them had babies. All four of them had uh, become involved with someone and become pregnant and had these children. So it was, uh, from what I now know, when the four of them got back to Chicago and began to compare notes, they found that the same man had told all of them the same story and had made all of them pregnant, that the same man was the father of all four of their children and had also been the father of the ch children brought forth by the two secretaries who preceded them. Mm -hmm. So this story was kept among these sisters until 1962, Two of them rebelled uh, against uh, the person who was responsible and began to tell the story all over the city of Chicago. It caused many of the Muslims in the Chicago mosque to leave and go back out in the street. They knew it. And uh, it, I knew nothing about it until 1963 when um, Mr. Muhammad's son, who had been in prison, uh, came out and he, was a, he had been a minister. And he was very religious and spiritual. And when he began to hear these rumors around Chicago, he went to one of the sisters and the sister admitted to him that the rumor was true. And uh, it was he who first told me about it. And when he told me about it, I, took, I wrote to Mr. Muhammad and told him about it. And he admitted that he had a knowledge of it and that uh, he'd given me a religious explanation that would fit into prophecy and all of that.
So I was quiet. And it wasn't until October of uh, 1963 that it came up again. And when it came up again, I realized that the same person who had uh, made these other sisters pregnant was still busy doing the same thing. He hadn't stopped. Two of the sisters had two children by the same man. And one of, the two, one of those two sisters was pregnant still, getting ready to have a third child by the same man. So when it was known uh, among the Chicago officials that I had a knowledge of this, they become very fearful of me. They became very antagonistic toward me, and they, they, had, they had to do something to diminish the authority that I had for fear that if this became public knowledge, the followers would leave the Muslim movement and follow me. Now that we have Malcolm's testimony, we can look at his earlier testimony from five years earlier. This letter is dated March 25th, 1959, that he wrote to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm going to read this letter, and then I'm going to break down and compare the letter statements to what he just stated to show the lies. Assalamu alaikum. In the holy name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, to whom all praise is due, whom we forever thank for giving us the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. My dear holy apostle, I do not like to burden you with personal troubles of my own, but I feel obligated to you to enclose the facts that are contained in this letter. It is you, thanks to Allah, who made me what I am today and I owe my life and my entire being to you, even though I know all praise is due to Allah. Therefore, since you are responsible for me, I owe it to you to let you know my condition, both good and bad, at all times. And this I have tried to do ever since I've been following you. This is why my letters often are very long. I never want to displease you. I did not give you all the facts on my domestic affairs. You once told me that you judge according to the facts presented to you, thinking that as a man, a Muslim, and as a minister, that I was automatically responsible and to blame for whatever condition my domestic affairs had fallen to, I in no way said anything at any time to make my wife look bad or to make her look to blame. But in attempting to carry the complete load with no explanation whatsoever of what made me act as I have. I now see would be doing myself some injustice. I have never made love to Sister Lucille, nor to Minister Robert's sister, Betty Sue. I did propose marriage to Sister Betty Sue, but never made love to her. Nor do I think that I ever even told her that I loved her. My proposal was governed by a suggestion to me, but when I learned it to be only a suggestion, I quickly tried to get out of it, for which I recognized my error in building her hopes. Of the above sisters, Sister Evelyn is the only one who had a legitimate beef against me, and I do bear witness that if she complains, she is justified, and also Betty Sue for me breaking my word. My brothers who follow you are slow to get married. This is not because they are against women, but because you have make us see the place of the man and the great responsibility involved to a sister after marrying her. If a brother means right by a believing sister, he has to move slowly to keep from involving himself in a role that he can't fulfill to the sister's satisfaction. And one's eyes don't have to be too far open to see that it is no easy task to satisfy a woman of today. So when he talks about Lucille, Betty Sue, and Evelyn in the paragraph above, what he is stating is that he never fornicated with Sister Lucille or Betty Sue. He stated it very clear. I have never made love to Sister Lucille, nor to Minister Robert's sister, Betty Sue. He talks about his proposals to them, and then he goes on to say, of the above sisters, Sister Evelyn is the only one who had a leg legitimate beef against me. And in a nation, when they have a beef, that means I slept with the sister and did not marry her, and she could bring me up on charges. 
So Malcolm X was with Evelyn before Elijah Muhammad. He sent this letter to them. And he told Mother Clara the same thing. Let me keep reading. This creates the situation where the sisters are more forward and aggressive in seeking husbands than the brothers are in seeking wives. I mentioned this not out of argument, disrespect, disagreement, nor to justify, but to point toward and shed more light on what created my own situation. I am not without blame or fault. I have many weaknesses. You once told me five years ago that one doesn't hunt wild game in the thick brush and not get one's hunting suit torn or one's flesh scratched. And most of my humble efforts have been in the thickest of brush among the wildest of game. Only Allah has saved me from being scratched and wounded unto death. He goes on to state, it's easier for a woman to pretend than for a man. She, meaning Betty, stayed miserable during her expectancy. And those were the nine most miserable months of my life too. She often cursed the day she married and of being pregnant. And she cursed me too. I don't blame her in that sense, because instead of trying to pacify baby her during those fits, I just withdrew further and from her. It was not that I didn't have love and compassion for her, but that she was driving me just as crazy as she was acting. So again, this is the great Malcolm X and the great Betty Shabazz, and people have these imaginary thoughts that other humans don't have problems. Yes, they do. Continuing on. Many a night she screamed and hollered until five o'clock in the morning, and I know the neighbors and other Muslims in the house must know it, though they don't speak of it. So I never tried to hide it. One of the things that made it worse my not intending to be ruled by a woman, and most of the times when she would be throwing fits purposely, it would make me so cold-hearted and drive me so far away from her that when her fit was for real, it was difficult for her to break through the wall that I had erected. Things got so bad between us that I stopped sleeping in the same bed with her the last three months of her pregnancy until three months after her pregnancy when she returned from Chicago. We were far apart then when she went to Chicago for those two weeks. She'd always talk of packing her bag and leave until I started agreeing with her that I think it best too. Then she changed, which made me really see that much of her screaming was just plain female characteristics. And she was always talking about getting a divorce until I started agreeing. Then again, I see the same reaction. This made me reach the conclusion that she just used that to upset me. Whenever she is leaving for a vacation somewhere, especially Chicago, then she gets very lovey-dovey, confessing all her faults and promising to do better when she returns. And I think she always really means it. Now, Malcolm was a little slow there. This is on my personal side. Whenever you see that behavior going on, she's going to see someone, Brother Malcolm. All right. That's what the excitement was for. That's what the shift is for. She's leaving you getting excited when she's around you. She's miserable. And this is for men who are watching this. You need to understand simple keys and codes. I had stopped all sexual relations with her shortly after her return from Chicago. She said to me that if I didn't watch out, she was going to embarrass me and herself, which under questioning, she later said she was going to seek satisfaction elsewhere. Yes, this is Betty Shabazz telling Malcolm X that I'm going to go get me some from somewhere else. So I renewed relations with her after six months of abstinence. Again, she this time outright told me that I was impotent. And even though I could father a child, I was like an old man, not able to engage in the act long enough to satisfy her. 
Now, you have to understand how this impacted Malcolm X. You need to understand why he mo he emotionally spiraled. Your teacher is with the woman that you wanted to be with and that you fornicated with and that you like. You're stuck with a woman that you don't like. And she's telling you that you are impotent. Look at his words. I had a frank discussion with her and told her for the first time that this was the source of all our troubles. Her remarks like this were very heartbreaking to me and would be to any other man. I explained that even if a woman thinks a man is not a man sexually, she should never tell him that, especially her husband, because from then on, he will always think she is pretending no matter how she acts and will take the whole act as just another waste of time. No matter what she says after that, the words have such a strong psychological effect that it stays on my mind as a man. And by you being a man, I think you can understand what I mean. Now we're getting the picture. Now we're beginning to see. Now we see what the animosity was. Now we see what drove Malcolm to go to extremes. And even though a part of his statements were true, he stretched them to his own benefit. He was angry about a wife that he had major issues with, who he could not please sexually. That is damaging to a man's psychology. Then you write this to your teacher and you find out that the one woman that you did like, who you fornicated with, is now with your teacher and with your teacher and your teacher kept it private. So this is what drove Malcolm X across the Harlem Bridge, if you want to use that terminology. He goes on to state, Brother Secretary John, now this is important, this is John Ali, and his family share this apartment with me, and his wife and mine treat each other with intense hostility. They can be in the same kitchen, cooking on the same stove, and never speak. Because I won't side with my wife when these little cat action come up, this also causes her upset. But I think the reason the two sisters don't get along is they both want their husbands, John and I, to go to great expense and debt to get them separate homes. The crowded conditions under which we live have only added to our antagonistic attitude toward each other. As a man, a Muslim, and a minister, my home life has been so far from Muslim-like that I've had difficulty for some time getting the spirit to teach when I'm in New York. I purposely sent Betty to spend those two weeks in Chicago before the convention so she could get light from you on all phases of our domestic life that were shaky. But instead, she pretended like everything was all right. We solved nothing because we came back and did worse. I wasn't complaining to your wife, this is Mother Clara, because I wanted in my business in the street. But I even told her that I was telling her so she could tell you at a time when you were relaxed and free from the pressure of some of your other problems. By her being right there with you, she could more easily tell you, tell when you are free from other worries. And it really is heartbreaking to me when I have to tell you of my personal trouble. So he told Mother Clara about all of his problems in this letter with Betty so she could tell the messenger. Now this information got leaked to one of the messenger's daughters 
Because at mass number seven, she insinuated these problems, weaknesses that Malcolm had. And this caused further trouble. In closing, I'd like to point out that I'm not finding fault with Betty. For I think she's only doing what all of the sisters would do and the way they react under the same circumstances. In fact, I think she has stood up longer and better with me than most of the others would, who may be quick to condemn her or me. If there is any difference, it is in me. For as a man, most men would not even be affected by these things. But my own past life has created psychological factors in my makeup that are difficult for me to overcome. Betty is the only Muslim that I've ever been very, very mean to. And she is my wife, which makes it all the more hurting to me. My marriage life has made me feel so bad and oftentimes guilty that I've stayed out of there on the highway in rain and snow going from temple to temple rather than face things here at home. Please forgive the language and topic of this letter. I write it out of all due love and respect for you as our beloved leader and teacher from the Lord of the Worlds and the only man who could have picked someone such as I up out of the mud and made me a respectful full person. I pray Allah, I have not caused you too much disappointment and displeasure. I write meekly, humbly, and respectfully to you, hoping that a knowledge of this will enable you to speak to my wife from any angle and upon any subject that you chose or choose while she is there and get her side of the story. I had a frank discussion with her before leaving, but she does not know the topic or contents of this letter. I have complete faith in whatever way you wish or may choose or may not to take it up with her. Whatever you may think of me, I do at least feel better now. Assalamu alaikum, your brother and servant. P.S. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. Malcolm X, I humbly and sincerely submit to Allah and his messenger. That is the end of the most important letter in the archives of the Malcolm X estate. This one letter shows the complete complexity of the problems of women being at the core of the breach and the break between Elijah and Malcolm. It centered around Malcolm having Evelyn as a girlfriend prior to the messenger. And they would even call girlfriends in the Muhammad Speaks. The statement that was made was those are Malcolm's girl's friends, Lucille and Evelyn, when they filed suit in the court. And this letter raises the history to say, okay, that is actual. And now we will move towards explaining more about these women who the Honorable Elijah Muhammad conceived children with so that we can get a clear picture of who they are and what happened. As for now, we can see the lessons that are needed to be learned, the facts that are needed for clarity, and the humble observation of what caused and catalyzed the shifts between two great men. Okay, now let's look at the wives. And let's look at some of the history so that we can get a proper picture of what happened during this time period. It's important to note that when the World Community of Islam was finally formed by Wallace Muhammad, also later known as 
Imam Ward to Dean Muhammad, that that community worked to take a little over $20 million from Elijah Muhammad's estate for itself. And so the women who claimed to have children with him and the eight children he had with Mother Clara fought over the assets. The messenger did not leave a will. And so all of these matters were handled in a court of law. The interesting thing that must be pointed out is that these petitions were filed by these particular women because it could not be resolved from the first family and Imam Wars, meaning he was not willing to give them any money at all. And the court was the entity that eventually said, well, we cannot do that. We have to give these children something from their father, which means that the messenger didn't write anything for them himself. So some of this history, we have to take it and look at it with a very acute eye so we understand what has happened. Okay. Banks must pay $4.6 million to Elijah Muhammad's heirs. A probate judge has ordered two Chicago banks to pay more than $4.6 million to the estate of Elijah Muhammad, the late leader of the Nation of Islam, now world community of Al Islam. Judge Henry Budzinski said the banks illegally paid money from Muhammad's bank account to the church instead of giving it to his heirs. When Mr. Muhammad died of natural causes in 1975, he left no will and the money was transferred by a bank to the religious sect. The judge ruled on a recovery petition filed on behalf of five of Muhammad's 21 legitimate and illegitimate children. Judge Bazinski ordered First Pacific Bank of Chicago to pay the estate $3,308,670 plus $1,336,347 in interest. Amalgamated Trust and Savings Bank was ordered to pay $4,094, including $1,151 in interest. The ruling affects only a portion of the fortune estimated at $20 million that Muhammad collected in the name of his religion. The wealth, which includes real estate and personal resources, is being fought over by the 21 children, 8 by his wife Clara, and 13 illegitimate offsprings by seven other women. Six of the women were identified during the testimony as Muhammad's secretaries. According to courtroom testimony, six of the seven women who conceived children out of wedlock for Mr. Muhammad and their children are Lucille Kareem Muhammad was one of the mothers. She had three children listed, Saudi Muhammad, Sumaya Muhammad, Bahia Muhammad. June Muhammad was one of the women. Abdullah Muhammad, Aisha Muhammad. Evelyn Muhammad was one of the women. Marie Muhammad was the child. Tainetta Muhammad was very popular. Had four children. Ahmed, Ishmael, Rasul, and Medea. Ola Hughes, Kareem Muhammad, had Kamal Hughes, Bernique Kashmir, who was the former wife of Bernard Kashmir, had Naima Kashmir, and the mother of the 13th child, Lovelita Claiborne, was not identified. The list that Malcolm gave of the teenage secretaries is inaccurate. But there was one that was a teenager, and that would be Ola Hughes Kareem Muhammad, who had Kamal Hughes 
as a son. And so now I want to go over that so we can see for a fact what happened with this particular young lady and why this caused so much controversy. All right, so this is Kamal and his mother, Ola, maiden name Hughes. And this was the woman who was born in 1944. So she was 15 when she got pregnant and 16 when she had her son. The records have been changed. Um, I suspect this is in their mind to protect themselves and to protect the messenger. And her birthday was backdated by six years. And his was upgraded by six years, as you're going to see as we review the records. But this is from a lecture that Minister Farrakhan did, and he brought all the wives out. It was very respectful, and it was uh, a great event. I just want to talk a little bit more about her history, too, because we're talking about these men, but we're not highlighting some important things. So this is Kamal Muhammad's Facebook page. Um, if you ever see this, brother, this is not to denigrate your family. I have the highest respect for you, your father, and your mother. I just want the people to put this to sleep forever. So you don't have to feel a certain way. And uh, no one in your family has to be ashamed of what has happened because you are all great human beings. Um, but this is the brother's Facebook page. And when you go to the Facebook page, you're going to see that he places his birthday in April of 1966, all right? Which um, would have made his mother, she was born in 1938. That would have given uh, her the age of 28 when she had him, and that is not accurate, okay? Um, the information was hidden by many people, and it was to protect Elijah Muhammad, but I don't think we need to do that anymore. And I think we need to um, maturely bring out the data. And this is why I'm doing this. There's so much malice and hatred and past hatred for decades and decades and decades. We need to get rid of that. All right. So this is Kamal Hughes' actual data. He was born on April 24th, 1960 in Chicago, Illinois, to his mother, Ola Hughes. Okay. Um and that would mean that his birth date was altered to six years, again, to protect his mother and to protect his father. Others have pointed this out in documentaries, this particular dating thing, and they did it in a very malicious way. I do not want to do that. All right. And this is Ola, Mother Ola. She was born February 22nd, 1944. And so she got pregnant in 59. You can see the letters from Malcolm and the talk that he gave about that. And then in 1960, Kamal was born to a 16-year-old. And the messenger was 63 years old at the time. So the controversy is a 63-year-old with a 15-year-old. But here something interesting happens. Here we have Ola's mom, Evelyn Hughes. And you'll see that um, she's listed as a partner. And Seattle is listed as a wife. And Matthew is listed as a partner. But essentially, Matthew had two partners. A wife, Seattle Stanton, and Evelyn. So Evelyn's mother, excuse me, Ola's mother, Evelyn Hughes, was in a polygynous relationship in Chicago prior to her daughter being in a polygynous relationship at a young age. You can see here she's 24 in the 1950 census. And so what we're going to find out is that Ola's mother got pregnant when she was 17 with her. And her daughter ended up getting pregnant at 15. So here we have young teenage pregnancy coming in two generations. So we have to evaluate the situation carefully so we can understand the dynamics that can produce this. You're a young girl. You're seeing your mother around a polygynous relationship. 
So you grow up to be 15 and polygyny is not foreign to you. Okay. This is what she evaluated. I'm not uh, co-signing anything. All right. And uh, that's important. So this is her in 1940, her mother, Evelyn. All right. Paris. All right. So that P, Evelyn P. Hughes is for Paris. Her original name was Paris. The unknown father of Ola um, and unknown grandfather must have had the last name Hughes because her maiden name, their grandmother's maiden name, Evelyn, is Paris. All right. You see it there. And you see Ressi L. Paris is the lodger and the uh, mother of these girls who, before moving with their mother to Chicago, and their mother's from uh, Missouri, they live with their father in Kansas. And this is all in the genealogy records that I'm showing you right now. This is Evelyn Paris at Chicago Heights High School. You can see she was on the choir, drama club, basketball, volleyball. Christmas play. So we're looking at Ola's mother's history. She's very involved, uh, athletics, and at the age of um, 17, as we're going to see, she eventually gets pregnant and has Ola. All right. And so she is from Missouri and um, she eventually moved to Chicago, Illinois. Now, I was unable to verify whether Evelyn, Matthew, Seattle, any of those people were in the early nation of Islam, because if he was a black man with two wives, it's interesting for him to have that going on um, in the 1940s. All right, and 50s, which... Uh, it leads us to more research that is needed, but this is the yearbook for Ola's mother. You can see um, the yearbook is from 1943. So the next year, in 1944, she had a child in Chicago, Illinois. Apparently didn't work out with the father of Ola. I don't know if he's deceased. I don't know. I can't find any records as of now. However, her mother was in a polygamous relationship. That is vital to tell this particular story and how things developed over time. All right. Her mother was a teenage mother. Mother Ola ended up being a teenage mother. Interestingly, though, they both got placed in secure environments, all right? Not just a teenage mother out in the street somewhere, okay? And this is John Paris, which is the grandfather of Ola and the father of Evelyn Paris. And again, he's from Kansas. Apparently, their parents separated, all right? John Paris and uh, Evelyn's mother separated. She lived with her father first, and she ended up moving to live with her mother, who was also lodging with some other family. So I haven't verified whether uh, the grandmother was polygynous, Evelyn's mother, but she was lodging with another man in the family. All right. So here you see John Paris with all of his daughters there. and. This family eventually becomes Ola and Kamal, who have had to hide their birthdays and do all these things so that they can attempt to protect themselves and to protect the messenger. But this was a little bit of background about them, so you'll know some genealogy about how things formed into what they became. All right, so let's cover a few other things. Here are Lucille and Evelyn with their attorney um, who filed suit against Elijah Muhammad for paternity and support. Now remember, Evelyn, pictured up top in the middle with a little girl on her lap, was fornicating with Malcolm X, 
according to Malcolm X's testimony prior to her being with Elijah Muhammad. And we have this filed on July 6th, 1964. The reason why I'm showing them is for two basic purposes. One, so we can identify with the faces and put this thing together. The drama between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad was over a woman. Everything else spiraled off from that. Here we have their ages at the time. In 1964, Lucille was 33 and Evelyn was 30. So these were not teenagers. None of the other women were teenagers except for the woman whom I pointed out. And that is most important because when we go to June, she was born in 1938. Well, the Tynetta was born May 10th, 1941. That would put her at... 23 years old during this time period and so Malcolm X made a gross statement when he tried to paint all of those secretaries as teenagers. It was a smear campaign at that point because it was personal. They had personal information on him that was being exchanged and talked about. He was in a terrible and a challenging marriage and he was only in his 30s a very young man going through a very very challenging experience and experiencing counterintelligence activity where there were people who were put in place to divide him from elijah muhammad and elijah muhammad from him This is the unfortunate truth. The agents did defeat Malcolm and Elijah. The goal expressed in the Muslim programs and the wants and beliefs was a universal government of peace. Malcolm was working on the political side. The break took away the power. The Quintel program, as we can see here, expressed that they wanted factional disputes and develop factional disputes. But how did they actually develop the factional disputes? That's what people don't know about. What did they do? Why did they want brotherhood in mankind and self-improvement instead of nationalism? The information about the three top level informants inside of the Nation of Islam delivering vital information to the FBI comes directly from the FBI's COINTELPRO program. They had five total agents. Two of them, I'll just name them, Jesse Jackson. This is my view from the research. And Al Sharpton. And three inside of the nation. There were three informants inside of the Nation of Islam. They worked to divide Malcolm from Elijah. Who was working to divide Malcolm from Elijah? Who took every opportunity to divide Malcolm from Elijah? Who saw benefit in Malcolm being dead or gone and an old Elijah going away? They have surrounded us with many of their own agents in uniform and out of uniform. It was interesting to see who was in that clip as he spoke about agents. The Muhammad Speaks began to attack Malcolm X publicly because of his stances. This was being done prior to him making those statements. There were officials in Chicago and in the Messenger's family who wanted him out. There was jealousy from other ministers. And so what do we gather to learn from this situation? We talk about the resurrection of the dead, and we're talking now behavior. 
and behavior being a part of our experiences, our memory, and how our biology functions. We talk about the resurrection of the dead. Soldier, come on, let go. This is a real thing. Improving human behavior is a real thing, but it takes science to do so. The issue with Malcolm is he never got over Detroit Red. He never got over the challenges of his past. He spoke this in a letter to the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In dealing with his wife, in dealing with the prior world he came from and how that impacted his interactions with his wife, his physical inability to please her. These are not things that were taught in the nation, how to please your wife if you're having a problem. In Arna, we teach those things. We published an entire dissertation called The Power of Sex. You never know what is happening between a man and a woman. If you're going to be a nation, you need institutions that can address everything. And just because someone is popular does not mean they don't need help. He reached out for help. He confessed that he had fornicated. That was a powerful moment. But was it just because you were talking to someone who you felt like was your superior? Because when the opportunity came to make amends, because now that man is with the woman that you wanted, and you are with a woman in Betty Shabazz that you don't want, anger, it lit up like a nuclear bomb. And from my study, he was in a situation that he could not avoid anyway. The jealousy was high for Malcolm X. The first family of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did not want him to be the successor. And he would have been the natural successor to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The United States government did not want a black man with political intelligence to create plebiscites and things of that nature and going to the UN and not talking about civil rights and talking about human rights, taking over the nation of Islam. As stated in their Cointel Pro memos, they wanted a population in the nation that was not focused on nationalism and was focused on self-improvement and becoming a better citizen. And those things are not problematic, but you can't become a better citizen as a denationalized group of original people without the institutions and the nationalism and the nationality to bring it about on your terms and autonomy. And this is what we have been left with. We have been left with undone work because two great figures, Al Haj, Al Malik Shabazz, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, are no longer with us, and their true vision has been destroyed by people who were put in place and who were already in place who were willing to compromise for various reasons. This is Malcolm's truth. Malcolm's truth is that you have a young, brilliant 39-year-old man who was assassinated by William X. Bradley, by Talmadge Hare, by others who orchestrated the plot because they decided that they would listen and adhere to Institutions that have historically committed genocide against our people. But Malcolm X's message did not die because we are here now to improve upon what was left of Malcolm's truth. A big love and shout out to El Hajj, Malik El Shabazz, 
Brother Omawali, a great, powerful standard of truth for us as people who made mistakes. Now we move to Elijah's vision and the fall of the nation in the second two parts of this series. And we hope that you have learned something. Thank you.